Hey everybody, so today we are going back into the vault of some earlier recordings that I have done, but one thing you don't see is in some of my honest reviews, I have a lot of really smart researchers and developers and startup founders that talk about a lot of contextual things that are important to this space. And so today is one of those things where I was talking to um, the CTO of OrangoDB and he was actually going over all of the different things that go into why Knowledge Graph and why LLM. And so he did such a great job in kind of walking through and explaining that. Unfortunately, I had to cut a lot of that out from the honest review which by the way, hasn't come out yet. It's coming out uh, this summer, but so stay tuned for that. But I wanted to put it out because this was such a good conversation. And so if you kind of like a little bit more of this contextual stuff from those videos that I unfortunately do have to cut out most of the time, please give this a like and leave a comment down below so I can do more of these. All right, so with that, let's go get started. Editing Ashley here. So I forgot to mention, this is not a sponsored video uh, at all. I don't actually know if Arango knows I'm putting this specific video out. It was part of a larger recording that we did before. Um, and it's also not focused on Arango DB at all. Um, it's just they have a CTO that's really passionate about this space. And he walked through a lot of great um, examples, uh, machine learning off connected data and networks. And I just thought it was a really um, helpful take. And so that's why we're here. So I hope you like it. What gets me up in the morning? What gets me here <laughs> excited to to talk to you on this channel? Yeah. Uh, let's maybe dive in. And what, what I would call that um, is uh, the theme of like simplifying superpowers in a connected world. And let me maybe briefly explain what I mean by that. We actually, we we, we live in, in, a, in a connected world. If, if we look around us, like uh, from network systems, telecommunication systems, social interactions, even like in fraud and security, if you see like access patterns, it's not about like one individual login attempt, which makes it like a security risk, or typically it's not like a single one, but it's typically, it's a pattern of multiple uh, related items. So I think this is why it's so important to realize we live in this connected world. And uh, in this connected world, actually like, knowing graph and knowing how to deal with this connected data, this is actually a superpower. And I think we want to a little bit talk about uh, how we can simplify access to these yeah, superpowers. Yeah, I mean, knowledge graphs are everywhere. Yeah. Uh, a lot of folks probably don't see them. Um, yeah. they're, they're behind the scenes of pretty much every interaction that you have. It Agree. If if you look at uh, AWS, if you look at Google, if you look what's like behind all the search, if you look uh, even like the semantic web, um, not we, we can briefly talk about it maybe a little uh, later, like how you can actually mm -hmm. connect uh, also those worlds of property graph and uh, RDF. Uh, mm -hmm. So happy to do a short uh, X course into that because I think this is what's all helping us together to, yeah, explain exploit and actually understand the connectedness of uh, data around us. Then maybe as, yeah, uh, RangoDB, we are a graph database. And I think I always feel it's important to also say like when not to use a certain tool. And I mean, the typical question I get is then uh, the obvious comparison between relational database systems and uh, yeah, graph graph database systems as, as an entire category. And I think both, it's, it's, uh, super powerful and super useful. It's just about you should know when to use which tool at exactly. your disposal. And so this is why I actually just dropped in this slide. So maybe just yeah. in, in short, I think relational database systems, or if you want to translate that into SQL database systems mm -hmm. is, is a ge generic uh, category. Not always, but I think it's a rough approximation. They are really great at if you if you look at access as like one of two dimensions. So I think, first of all, if you just care about like each individual row, right? I mean, just imagine you have here your product database or transaction database, and, and all you do is just insert and, and retrieve each product. You don't need a graph database for that because it's really you just care about each individual item, each each individual row, uh, so to say. The 
Uh, I think the other kind of use case, um, probably you're seeing that as well, kind, kind of are the columnist store databases. Yeah. And they are great for analytics if I care about like the, the Y dimension here, basically. So for example, if I want to know an average price per category uh, for product. And so they are really great at aggregating along those lines. But as soon as I kind of want to leave those those two dimensions and care about mm -hmm. the interactions between different rows here. So for example, uh, with products, just what is a co-purchasing pattern? Which products yeah. were bought together? Go well, ahead. And I, I just want to, who knows yeah. to you? Because um, not many folks, I feel, mm -hmm. are confident enough to say, when do you not need a graph? Right. Yeah. And also, I mean, it's use cases. Right. So these two work together too. like maybe you have those relational databases that you use just for, you know, price analytics. Um, but then you need a graph on top of them to do, you know, product recommendations mm -hmm. or something. You can you can layer these together. Yes. So it's not yeah. one or the other. Yeah, yeah. It, it, exactly. Yes. And uh so, uh, I, and I think this is uh, where uh, the kind of relational systems start to fall uh, short, or it gets really hard from actually two dimensions. I think the first thing where you usually notice is, is just from like a developer experience, like writing a self-referential SQL uh, statement uh, to figure out like what is the shortest path, et cetera, somewhere. That, oh, that gets painful. really hard. And, <laughs> yeah. uh, and it, costly. It also, it also, it, and, and costly, yeah. especially like, not just developing it once, but I think the maintenance cost of that is super high. If I need to adapt my uh, my application, if there is a new field, if there is a new relation coming in, I actually usually have to touch everything. And whoever mm -hmm. has done schema transformation in such relational database systems, it is it it is hard. It sucks to yeah put it out pretty bluntly there yeah. so i think this is usually where people first realize like writing that long sequel or writing like a, a graph traversal in like two maybe three lines uh it, it becomes a lot easier to write and i think even more importantly it becomes more maintainable over time because i can more clearly see the intent which was implied there I well, think it's the, more the split it too, right? Like yeah. in the logic, like why are these two things related? Whereas in a relational exactly. like join yeah. and you don't know why they're joined in graph, you can be more explicit about that. It, 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 exactly. Ex exactly. Yes. Um, and I think that the second uh, dimension comes in as soon as you look at performance, like join optimization is a really hard problem in, rel in relational database mm -hmm. systems. I implemented a number of uh, relational database <laughs> systems in my past and trust me, also, if you look at conferences, VLDB, Sigmod, et cetera, join optimization is still a very hard problem out, yeah. out, out there. So graph database systems, ESSA actually treats those relationships as first-class citizens and not just kind of like a derived, like set on top as joins. Right. Uh, they, they also like optimize for that way better. And <laughs> I would say like typical, I mean, maybe Oracle can do a few more, but again, that comes in also at a price uh price tag down there yeah um uh, if, if as soon as you go like above like five or ten uh, ten different joints uh usually performance will will actually degrade yep so exactly. i think this is kind of like if, if, if you look at it if you see your profile is spending a lot of time in uh down in join optimizations or if your developer spend a lot of time like optimizing maintaining these long join statements mm -hmm. especially self-referential joins yeah. uh then then it's, I think it's actually time to think about uh, graph database. Love it. All right, but just pu pu pulling that back uh, to, to what we said earlier, actually, this is all about the question, do we live in a connected, do you care about a connected world or do you care about individual items? And, and I said, like, both have their use cases. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you care about connected data, then actually I think it's uh, good to look, yeah, it's a power of graph out there. I mean, think of it from a perspective yeah. of me mm -hmm. as an individual, mm -hmm. I have data yeah. about myself, right? Yeah. That is my relational. <laughs> I, I am just me. I have a birth date. I have a, a hopefully yeah. not death date right now. <laughs> That'd be weird. No. I'd be a ghost. Um, but point is, I would have data about myself, but that's a very, you know, finite amount of information. If I need to now figure out, you know, who am I related to? Who are, are the people in my network? What are my buying patterns? What are, you know, what's my health record look like over the years? Yeah. All of that is a connection, right, to me. So I'm a node and I have my own little information and then I connect out to other little nodes. So that's kind of how I think about I, I, it. And I describe it I, to I, like my grandma. 
Yeah, I, 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 I love that. And let me actually maybe just quickly jump over to something I wanted to touch up on, on a bit later. But I think as we, as this is actually a discussion, let's quickly jump to what, when we talk about M ML, Chris, I think there I'm seeing a very similar problem and actually with a very similar example as you've just used. In traditional machine learning, again, and there are use cases where this is super valid, you actually care about individual data items, just about, you just have like yourself there. And that was the other reason why I liked it, because I otherwise would have quickly jumped to the slide introducing myself, but we'll do that a bit later. <laughs> um, and so traditional machine learning is really focused on each individual data item. But in a, in a real connected world, as you, as you just explained so nicely, this actually doesn't hold true uh, anymore. So for example, if, if, if you look at like a churn, imagine you have your social network, uh, you're a manager up there at Meta, LinkedIn, et cetera, and you try to predict like who, which of your users will become, uh, will become inactive. So you can target them, you can engage them more. And with traditional machine learning, exactly, this is uh, again, just tying back to that, is you have like a feature back to describing you yourself as an individual item, right? So you have like some features there and then Based on that, you train a machine learning model or you have some analytical algorithm to come up with your churn risk out there. But if you think about it, uh, if, if all your friends are leaving uh, Facebook or actually don't know what are the hip networks uh, nowadays, and I feel like I'm getting too old for that. Uh, but uh, imagine like all your friends either have a very high churn risk uh, by themselves or have already left the network. What does yeah. it do with your own risk of leaving that network as well? It, it obviously goes up. And I think this is kind of like the importance of analyzing and caring about data in context so yes. you can also get better results uh, in terms of your machine learning. I think like in, in machine learning or analytics in general, like the more input data you have, the better results you will get. Absolutely. It, it, it is about you in context of that network and that will actually determine your churn rates and not just that uh, feature vector by itself. Yeah, I mean, think of it from, from even a social media perspective, right? My churn mm -hmm. rate and my my flags, you know, on, on my network analysis with GraphML is going to be very different. Those flags are going to be different on LinkedIn versus Facebook, right? I probably yes. use Facebook, which I don't actually have Facebook, but I, if I did, I would be using it for a very different reason than LinkedIn, right? Like those are different types exactly. of social networks. And that's why having, you know, this, this graph ML to help you kind of tease out what are those, those characteristics per different social network, or even if you're on a social network where maybe people can have multiple types of persona, this is where like persona management is, is helpful too. Um, that is where GraphML really shines, is it can kind of tease all of those things out for you. Yeah. And uh, I, I so sometimes I personally actually dislike the term graph machine learning. Uh, Chris, mm -hmm. in the end, it's just, it, it makes it sound so fancy, so obscure. In the yeah. end, it's machine learning on, on yeah. connected data, exactly. right? So exactly. I, I think that makes it a lot more accessible to people. Yeah. And I think this is also what, what we all here uh, can keep in mind, that yeah. this is nothing super fancy this is actually very similar techniques down there it's an active area of research so kind of like in the past five years this is kind of, if you look at neurops and other conferences mm -hmm. machine learning conferences it's like gone up quite considerably yeah. um and i think it will probably just I, I think traditional machine learning will remain there as said like it's similar as relational database systems and graph database systems use the right tool for the right job but i think especially if you're live analyzing, doing machine learning in a connected uh, yeah. data set. And those connections actually can have a significant impact. So we had multiple customers who could really raise the precision and uh, of their outcomes, the accuracy of their outcomes, uh, because uh, all of a sudden you actually take take all of that into account, which otherwise you actually ignore it before. So you're actually yeah. introducing like this assumption of like everything is independent. It, it, is, it is false, right? Yeah. It can either be positively uh, correlated can even be negatively correlated but in particular it's not independent of each other and also it's not identically distributed this is not something new like i, I will put something up on the screen yeah it's the cholera outbreak in london you know yeah. visual that's a connect connected network people were getting so sick and they couldn't figure out why and so before machine learning existed, they were doing this, this network analysis to discover that was because there was a polluted well in London that was making everyone sick. Yep. So this it, has been around for a while. It's just now we can do it better. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 exactly.
So, so I think like uh, what you just said, like even if a, if a data scientist comes in and says like, oh, I can do my cluster analysis by myself. If I do that in an enterprise setting, I actually need kind of the, uh, the access control. I kind of need the logging. I need the repeatability of that uh, in there. And I think this is something where where I felt like more ML projects have failed in the past because yeah. of uh, not being able to operationalize it, mm -hmm. much rather than just having a bad model, a bad data set yeah. out there. Of course, all of that is super critical, but I've seen more projects really fail because the lack of uh, operationalization and therefore getting real end-to-end -end value out of it. And I yeah. think this is really where the intersection of databases and machine learning is coming in. And I think this is this is a really nice paper uh, just describing that. If you're in an enterprise, you have a large fleet of business analysts, uh, executives, managers, and they actually want to extract insights uh, from, from a graph. Right now, there's either a dashboard being built on top, or you actually have to go to the expert team and kind of like ask them. And the problem of that, it, it's a long turnaround time, it's added burden to the expert team. And it's really hard to to ask in, uh, like, in a chat-like way, right? Because typically you're not just have like one question, you actually have follow-up <laughs> questions. Yeah. And so that actually explodes then just in terms of latency. Yeah. So. And I think this is really where uh, kind of that knowledge graphs and large language models, they can augment each other really, really yeah. well. Yeah. Uh, Chris, large language models by themselves, they, they also have problems. Uh, so for example, yeah. I think you already mentioned hallucinations uh, earlier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and in the end, I think that comes from, if you ask a chat GPT just blank out, it will retrieve knowledge from from a neural network down there. And by itself, this is a highly probabilistic and unstructured data store. Yeah. So it's really not good to store knowledge. Knowledge <laughs> graphs, uh, on the other hand, they're an explicit data store, but they are hard to access, right? Yeah. Uh, and I think if we combine the powers of both together, yeah. that can really allow people um, a much wider access. And I think it's yeah. not just for querying it. Uh, we can also talk a little bit more about like, it can also help to kind of like maintain a knowledge graph, uh, mm -hmm. get information in there. But I think the biggest advantages to most people out there is that we actually split uh, the responsibilities of, of a large uh, language model there. Uh, natural language capabilities, and then on the other hand, uh, the explicit knowledge uh, storage. And if we yeah. move that out, and I think this is also where the strand of retrieval augmentation is coming from, I think we end up with a very powerful uh, powerful system there. To di dive a little deeper into like, how can we actually maintain a knowledge graph uh, from unstructured data using LLMs? So I think, uh, and uh, we'll uh, probably, as uh, blog posts coming out soon, also have something on our site. So stay, mm -hmm. stay tuned. and. Also happy, happy to talk about it in, in more detail. Uh, but basically, uh, large language models, especially if you have already an ontology, if you already have your graph schema set up in, in one way or the other, so uh, they can be super powerful in extracting entities, in discovering mm -hmm. relations, but then also kind of like deduplication in the end. So for example, if you look at Wikipedia, you'll have Barack Obama in like many different, like mm -hmm. uh, using middle names, et cetera, yeah. B.Obama and a uh, large language model, pretty good at kind of this entity resolution, uh, kind of uh, maintaining it from that natural language uh, out there. Um, I think this, this is one part. So I, I believe, especially if you have something unstructured data, you have an existing graph mm -hmm. uh, together with an ontology, large language models can be super powerful yeah. in kind of maintaining and updating it because they yeah. don't have to create a new structure from scratch, but they work with an existing structure. Yeah. And this is where we have seen very powerful results um, in Yeah, I mean, this is great because uh, so the ontology is almost... Um, you know, the the directions given to the LLM. Yes. The unstructured documents are being fed through that those instructions so that the LLM or at least the graph that's being generated from it um, can be updated. Because that's always, you know, a, a concern with LLMs is that they're a snapshot in time when they yep. were trained. So they mm -hmm. don't really know the new stuff that happened like an hour ago, but through some of this. And these unstructured documents could be scraped from the web, right? Like that's where you get some exactly. of that yeah. currency. So, so, so I think that it comes back to what we also said earlier on the retrieval side, right? Mm -hmm. You kind of want to 
not rely on the knowledge stored in the LLMs directly. Chris A, it's as as you just mentioned, it's out of date. It's yeah. probably uh, uh, prone to hallucination. Of course, yeah. LLMs are are not a data store. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I think as soon as you start separating that, uh, you can a have access to your uh, like private data you just don't want to yeah. share on the internet yeah. you can have access to up-to-date data and mm -hmm. uh, i think that the last benefit of that you can also provide back traces 